I swear every time I go back to do any kind of passage breakdown or look at any of the double AMC full length tests, I am still utterly shocked at their explanations and how bad they are. They're literally so unhelpful, but that's kind of why we started this channel. So if you're new here, hello, my name is Maggie. I'm a third year medical student and I used to be a professional MCAT tutor as did my brother John who also runs this channel. And the purpose of our channel and our larger business of IFD is to bring MCAT resources to the masses. And for this video, I'm going back to our roots. I'm doing a passage breakdown and it's been a minute. A little caveat about this is that I haven't studied for the MCAT since, I took the MCAT in January of 2021. So that was over three years ago and I have lost so much of that like basic science knowledge that I once knew. But when I'm going through and I'm looking at these passages and I'm kind of prepping to do one of these videos, I still don't miss that many questions. And the reason why is because I have good test taking strategies and I still know the high yield facts because me and John have made resources for them. So like it stands to reason that if you know these high yield facts and you're good at taking tests or you have test taking strategies, you know, that you can probably get most of these questions right. So that's what we're here to teach you. We're here to teach you high yield sciences and test taking strategies. And I'm going to go through this passage and kind of point out what I was thinking when I was going through this passage and what I was thinking when I was going through the questions and then try to explain the the questions better than the double AMC, which is actually like an extremely low barrier. So let's get in right into it. This is the free practice exam, double AMC, FLE5 or whatever. The scored one, CP, I think. Passage seven. So just to remind everybody, I'm gonna read aloud and I'm gonna say what I'm thinking in my head as I'm reading. It starts out the macrocyclic carbon suboxide MCS hexamer gives us a formula and MCS octamer gives us a formula, figure one. We're determined to be sodium pump inhibitors. And I apologize for this quality, it's a little blurry. But when I'm going through this, so we have our strategy on our uh, strategies playlist called flow charting, and then we have another one called foreshadowing. So I'm basically gonna do both of those as I go through here. And when I see sodium pump inhibitors, it's talking about this MCS, the hexamer octamer is sodium pump inhibitors. I'm immediately thinking of inhibition, competitive inhibition, Michaela Minton like, you know, line weaver, Burke, like all that kind of stuff. I'm also thinking about sodium pump stuff. I'm thinking about plasma membrane. I'm thinking about gradients. I'm thinking about the different type of pumps, the symport, whatever. Like just because they mention the word sodium pump inhibitors, they're not gonna ask you, they might not ask you about this. Though they might ask you about any of the range of things that I just mentioned. And so you need to be opening your mind to all of those things and constantly thinking about how could they ask me about these sodium pump inhibitors? Or like, how could they ask me about, you know, Michaelis Minton kinetics, but, you know, dress it up as one of these sodium pump inhibitor things. That's a little bit of foreshadowing. I'm trying to predict what kind of questions they're gonna ask, so I'm not like totally bamboozled when I get to the questions and they're asking about Michaelis Minton kinetics, even though they never talked about it in this passage. I'm not saying they will. I don't even remember what the questions are. I just did it like 30 minutes ago. But anyway, as far as flow charting goes, this is like, I mean, this is just a sentence. There's no relationships that I need to mark up. It gives us the structures, which is always a little bit sus when they give us structures of something, like maybe they'll ask about these structures in some way, but I have nothing to do with it right now. It says these cylindrical macrocycles, which are aromatic. All right, aromatic, I'm starting to think of uh, conjugation, um, UV spec, I'm starting to think of resonance, all that kind of stuff, are formed from the polymerization of monomeric, whatever that is. At 550 Celsius, carbon monoxide converts to carbon suboxide in reaction one. And so they give us a reaction also sus. So they might ask us about this reaction, but we have nothing to do with it right now. So let's kind of like sum up what we're thinking. This is not a car's passage, but I kind of like to treat them the same because active reading is important. So these cylindrical macrocycles, so the MCS hexamer and octamer are formed from this reaction, I suppose, and they're sodium pump inhibitors. So I'll do a little bit of flow charting. I'll just take this molecule and I'll say MCS, and then I'm gonna make another arrow and say sodium pump, and then I'm gonna Whoops, I'm gonna like mark it out so it's like inhibits. If you're totally confused on why I'm drawing on this passage and everything, go watch our flow charting strategies video. That's all I'll say. MCS oligomers can be obtained from plants via lipophilic MCS precursor. A lipophilic, okay. Starting to think so. All things solubility is super high yield on the MCAT. 
This NCS precursor was isolated from plant roots through an extraction that involved mixing an aqueous emulsion with tert butyl methyl ether, and they give us this. So I'm gonna flowchart a little bit because I want to remember this like lipophilic fact, and I'm just gonna say li lipo. <laughs> There's a lipophilic precursor that makes this. That's how my brain's working right now. I don't think that there's that much more that's very interesting about what I just read. After sodium hydroxide digestion, the active NCS oligomers in figure one were purified on a column containing amber list 15, which is a strongly acidic neutral stationary phase. Ooh, ooh, ooh. They're talking about like a chromatography or some kind of separation technique. So this might come back, very high likelihood that it'll come back. I'm not gonna write that on my flow chart because I think it would just waste time. Or actually I am, I, I lied. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna say it's gotta be separated. And I don't think that's spelled right. Don't come for me, I can't spell. It says the MCS oligomer mixtumer, mixtumer <laughs> was analyzed via mass spec. Okay, that's kind of a low yield lab technique. And the ratio of MCS hexamer and octamer was found to be 65 to 35. The most significant mass to, I think that's charge peaks were all those numbers, which are attributable to a variety of complexes between sodium and the MCS oligomers. This passage is starting to bore me. They might ask about these like mass to charge numbers, but I don't know. I'm not going to write them down because they're just listed out right there. I'll come back if I need them. Membranes containing sodium potassium ATPase. That's our sodium potassium pump. Super important. More, more med school high yield than I would say MCAT high yield, but it's a good example of like an enzyme that they talk about pretty frequently. So membranes containing the sodium potassium pump were prepared and specific activity of pure ATPase was determined to be 2,000 micromole fo uh, what kind of unit is that? Whatever that is, at 37 degrees Celsius. See, if we were if we were little anxious students studying for the MCAT, that would make us nervous. That unit that we can't even say. But we are not anxious little students studying for the MCAT. We are confident students studying for the MCAT. So we're just not going to care about that. That doesn't matter. There's some PhD out there that knows what that is and we are not them. And so we don't care. The ability of the MCS oligomers to inhibit ATPase was determined by monitoring the specific activity of the ATPase of various MCS oligomer concentrations. When those inhibition data were fitted with the Hill function, the resulting coefficient was 2.56. Ooh, Hill coefficient. What is that? That's cooperativity. So I'm already thinking that that's a hill greater than one, and so that's positive cooperativity. And we're given this figure right here, so always read the figure caption first. Concentration dependent inhibition of ATP is by the MCS oligomer mixture, then read the axes, specific en enzymatic activity, and then MCS concentration, and we can see that the activity goes down as you increase the uh, MCS concentration, which was pretty intuitive because it said it was an inhibitor of sodium pumps, right? But you see the sigmoidal, and that is, um, that's just, again, displaying the cooperativity. So that's just another way to look at it. If it was straight, then it would be no cooperativity. But the more, like, curvy S that it is, it's more highly, like, cooperative or whatever. I guess I shouldn't draw it back on itself. It's not going to look like that. The most it could be is like that. Okay, so now, you know, this, like, kind of... A uh, relatively boring, scary, at the same time, CP passage doesn't look so bad, right? We have this reaction that makes this, which is a sodium pump inhibitor. It comes from a lipophilic precursor, and we have to separate it out using all this crap we were talking about that. And then it inhibits the ATPase, the sodium potassium pump, with positive cooperativity. Not bad, right? If they ask me about this unit, I'm going to crap my pants. All right, number 36 says, what is the name of the functional group containing the external oxygen on each ring of the MCS structure shown in figure one? So the external oxygen. So these guys? Yeah, because these would not be, these would be internal, right? So the only other oxygen they can talk about is this, and it just asks what functional group that is. So that's a ketone, right? You can like barely tell what this freaking quality, but... That's a double line, so it's a ketone. What would it be if the oxygen was right? There was an oxygen right here. It'd be an ester, right? Because an ester is like an ether plus a ketone. That's kind of how I think about it. Anyway, yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Just a ketone. Definitely got to know your um, functional groups. So, right, this is an aldehyde if it has a hydrogen on the side, and then 
Y'all know what a carboxylic acid is, and then I just showed you what an ester is, and then a ketone is just the R to R, of course the R's being carbons, and then the, the ketone. The next one says, based on reaction one, when one atmosphere of CO completely reacts to form carbon suboxide at 550 Celsius in a sealed container, what's the final pressure in the container? Okay, so we're talking about pressure. Let's go back up to this reaction. So, okay, I think I can see how they're trying to confuse us. Definitely take note of the four in front of the CO here. So what this tells us is that we have four moles CO and we're going to two moles of other stuff. So in my mind, going from four to two, as far as moles go, I'm probably either like for the math to math, I'm thinking I'm either gonna have to like, my pressure is gonna cut in half or it's gonna double. That's me like using half of my brain and just thinking like, if this, like, without using any math at all, it's either going to cut in half or double. And so all of these numbers are less than one. So I'm thinking now that it's going to cut in half. But if I want to, like, check myself, and you should, you should don't completely go off vibes. We have a pressure, and we have moles, right? Four versus two. So that may make you think of a certain little equation, the ideal gas law. So we're not changing, obviously we're not changing the constant or the temperature or the volume, we're changing the moles, right? We're going from four to two, so we're decreasing it by 50%. So in order to keep this equation equal on both sides as it would be, when you're not changing temperature or pressure, I'm gonna have to decrease your pressure by 50%. And so you would go from one to 0.5 atmospheres. So this first question was making sure that you knew your functional groups. This one was making sure you knew the gas law. But you see how they can dress them up and make them sound so sciencey? That's why we gotta like simplify the question down and we got to like use logic reasoning. We've got to hold on to units. We've got to do all these little tricks to make the MCAT easier because they, they make it so complicated, which is reasonable. They're trying to weed out the smartest of the smart, which is you. The next question says, in which phases will the MCS precursor be predominantly found after the extraction step? The MCS precursor will. So um, I'm going to go back up to the passage and to my flowchart. I know that the MCS precursor was lipophilic or lipophilic, but I don't exactly remember like the extraction process. So I'm going to go back and I remember it was like in this paragraph. Okay, so it was isolated from plant roots for, through an extraction that involved mixing an aqueous emulsion with terp-butyl methyl ether and then going through this. So lipophilic, what's our solubility rules, right? Like dissolves like. So where is a lipophilic substrate if I mix it in with an aqueous solution and some ether, where's it going to go? It's gonna, the lipophilic is gonna go to the lipophilic. And this is something that you should just know, put it on a flashcard. Ethers are like hydrophobic, lipophilic, whatever you wanna say. Regardless, you know it's not gonna go in the aqueous, right? So let's go down to the answer choices. Is it gonna be found in the aqueous layer? No, it's lipophilic. It's gonna, it, it's like dissolves like. It's gonna be found in the terp butyl methyl ether layer. Yes, ethers are lipophilic. C, it's gonna be distributed equally between the aqueous and the methyl ether, no. Why would it be distributed? You know, it's like, like dissolves like. It's not going to go in the aqueous layer, period. Form a precipitate between the aqueous and terp-butyl methyl ether layers. If you know that ether is lipophilic and like dissolves like, then you would not want to pick this either. So you would go towards B. Based on figure two, what is the approximate Ki? You can hardly see this. It's Ki of the NCS oligomers. The passage never mentioned Ki. When I think of K, I'm thinking one of two things things. I'm thinking products divided by reactants, which is what most of your K is going to be. That's what your Ka is. That's what your like Ksp is. Lighting is terrible. But the other option for K is like Km. And Km, I like to think of that. That's the Michaelis-Minton constant. I mean, uh, the Michaelis-Minton thing. And that is the concentration of substrate at half Vmax. Now, if we're looking at figure two, like how am I gonna figure out if they're talking about products over reactants or something more akin to Km? I'm gonna go back up to figure two. They want me to look straight up at this. Is there any products or reactants like amounts that I can look at? No. Is there anything that's reminiscent of like Michaelis-Minton graphs or like enzyme kinetics graphs? Yes. 
We have enzymatic activity over here, which is like exactly how it is on a michaelis minton graph. And we have concentration on the x-axis, which is exactly the same again. If I'm taking my knowledge of what Km is, I can take it and put it onto this Ki variable that I've never heard of. And if you have heard of Ki, that's, you know, even better. But if you haven't, like I hadn't, then you're gonna have to like figure out a way to extrapolate this knowledge and put it onto a new variable. So if we're looking at one half of Vmax or the Vmax, you know, the Vmax of inhibition, right? Because K and Michaelis Minton is looking at how enzyme takes reactant to product or substrate to product. This inhibition is going to pr essentially prevent that process. So this would be our max inhibition, right? We're like hardly getting any enzyme activity of the ATPase down here. This will be max. So what is half of the maximum? That's right here. So if I'm looking on this plot, then I can say, well, what is the MCS concentration at half that? It's about this little dash right here. So what would that be? That would be 0 0.01, this would be 0 0.02, 0 0.03. So 0 0.03 micromolars. So if I'm taking this, then I know that micro is times 10 to the negative six, but all of my answer choices are in nano, which is times 10 to the negative nine. So I need to move over a little bit. I move over to the right, one, two, three. That gives me 30 times 10 to the negative nine, which is B. I hope that made sense. All I did was try to figure out what Ki is by seeing what information I had. I decided it was probably analogous to Km. I took the definition of Km, came up with like the half of the Vmax of inhibition, found the concentration of the MCS, and then just converted like scientific notation. And that's how I ended up with B. Okay, this video is getting a little long, so I'm gonna wrap it up. Based on the reported Hill coefficient, in what way do the MCS oligomers affect inhibition? And that's, this is a good one to end on because we actually already talked about it up in the passage, which is a great example of foreshadowing. And yet another plug for you to go watch the strategy videos on our channel. This is my cat Coco, if you're new here. So as I said, a Hill coefficient of greater than one is gonna be positive cooperativity. If it's less than one, so if it's like a decimal place, then it's gonna be negative cooperativity. Positive cooperativity means that as you add substrate, it makes it more likely that you're gonna get more substrate. Negative inhibition will be the, the opposite. So as you add more substrate, you're less likely to acquire other substrate. It's most commonly talked about in uh, hemoglobin. And I think that that's a good kind of schema to have in your brain about how this works because it, it's the only thing I think of when I think of cooperativity, but I don't, I don't need another example because hemoglobin is such a good example. And if you're curious about how that is, uh, you can get our ebook or our e-course. It's in our hemoglobin and oxygen desaturation curves chapter. So based on the Hill coefficient of 2.36 or whatever it was, how does the MCS oligomers affect inhibition? You just got to choose the answer choice that is the definition of positive cooperativity. So that's A. Don't let this little last part leading to inhibition like trip you up. The whole point of the MCS oligomer is to inhibit ATPase. It's not like the binding of the MCS to the ATPase is inhibited. That's actually like the opposite. It's not inhibited. It is like it's promoted by the binding of MCS. But since MCS is an inhibitor, that it's kind of like you got to think about it both ways. But don't let that trip you up. Okay guys, that's all I have for you today. I hope that that was helpful. We may or may not be back on the passage breakdown grind, but I thought that I should get one out there because I literally haven't made one in so long that wasn't a cars passage. But all right, I will see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.